Well, thank you very much for coming. My name is Miriam Contreras, and I'm a second year PhD student at the School of Health Sciences. Um, I'm a psychologist specialized in older adults by background, and today I'm going to share with you some of the findings of my PhD project that is looking at factors that affect the quality of life of family carers of people with dementia. So I will start talking a little bit about the background, uh, about some facts about dementia in the UK and family carers in general. After that, I will uh, discuss some of the findings from the first study that was looking at factors that correlated to the quality of life of family carers. Uh, after that, I will um, discuss with you some of the findings from the second and third study that it was looking at the uh, risk and protect protective factors that affect the family care quality of life. Uh, I will also uh, summarize some of the main conclusions of these three studies and I will finish by uh, discussing the next steps and what I'm planning to do with this research uh, in study four and number five. So in the UK, it's estimated that around 850,000 people live with dementia. And from this total, around 87% receive help from family members. Dementia is one of the most expensive health conditions. And it's estimated that the total annual cost is around the 26 billion pounds. The total cost of dementia care for only one person it's on average £100,000, but for, this, uh, for some people, this cost can be much higher as well. And what I found, one of the most shocking aspects about dementia care in the UK is that family carers shoulder two-thirds of all the dementia care costs annually. So from this uh, total that I mentioned before, 17 billion are covered by the people with dementia and their relatives. So basically, family carers, they uh, save the UK economy billions annually on health and social care uh, costs. And for this reason, it's very important that carers are supported as well. So I wanted to make a couple of clarifications uh, because as you have seen the title of this presentation, I'm going to talk about family carers. But when I was assessing some of the participants, I, I realized that some people didn't see themselves as a family carer, and that's completely understandable. But I just wanted to make it clear that even though if I'm going to say family carers, I will be referring to any family that is supporting someone with dementia. And this could be something more physically demanding, like per personal care, but also can be uh, supporting, uh, giving support, uh, emotional support or companionship as well. So according to the existing literature, family cares of people with dementia, they have high levels of physical burden and psychological distress. They also have a very high prevalence of depression and anxiety. And they have uh, almost twice as many unmet needs as people with dementia, especially in the areas of company and daytime activities. They also feel that they have no or not enough support from other people, and this can include other family members, and eight out of 10 carers they feel are isolated. So um, relative, relatively little attention has been given to the positive aspects of caring in the scientific literature, uh, but some of the studies say that uh, carers might develop a sense of personal accomplishment and gratification, feelings of mutuality and a dyadic relationship, an increase in family cohesiveness and functionality, and a sense of personal growth and purpose in life. Uh, however, uh, carers, family carers, are more likely to experience negative consequences if they feel less satisfaction from the role as a carer. So for this reason, it's, it's very important that we can focus on finding ways to improve their well-being and their quality of life. Other reasons why I will be also uh, focusing on quality of life in my research 
is because uh, there are some national guidelines and policies in the UK and they all emphasize the need for focusing on early intervention for carers to support them maintaining their quality of life. And even though at the moment there are uh, several interventions that have has been developed for family carers, uh, most of them they are not supported by evidence like in most of the educational interventions and sometimes the evidence is still unclear, for example, in some of these psychotherapeutic interventions. For this reason, it's very important that, uh, to identify all these modifiable factors that may affect the family care quality of life, and hopefully this can help us to guide the formulation and delivery of new policies, new uh, treatments, and also new interventions to improve this outcome. So uh, for my PhD project, I have been following the Medical Research Council guideline on how to develop and evaluate complex interventions. Um, this guideline is in the process of being updated at the moment, so I've been taking uh, that in consideration. Um, now, have been following a number of steps that they suggest. And in the first study, I have identified the evidence base by updating a systematic review. In the second and third study, I have developed theory-led research questions. And for the study four and study five, I'm planning to uh, consider the future implementation of a support program and also involve uh, stakeholders such as healthcare professionals and family carers and former family carers. So for the first study, I have used a systematic approach to review all the existing literature that has been uh, published and that we're looking at factors that correlated to the quality of life of family cares of people with dementia. So you may not be able to see, <laughs> to read it from there, because it's quite small, but the important thing that you have to know from this figure is that at the beginning I found 2,446 studies, but in the end only 33 met the inclusion criteria that was very specific for this study. So what I wanted to do, it was to uh, do a specific, specific um, data analysis that is called a meta-analysis, that is the way to combine the data from multiple studies. And in the end, only 27 studies were included in this uh, meta-analysis. So the reason behind this is because, for, uh, because you need at least three studies that are reporting the correlation between care quality of life and the same variable. For example, there were uh, two studies that reported a very high correlation between quality of life and care anxiety, but I couldn't include uh, these two studies because uh, even the correlation was very strong, uh, I only had two studies. So that's the reason why there are six uh, studies that are missing. So from these 27 uh, studies that were included, they were looking at the correlation between care quality of life and care depression, their subjective burden, care distress, their age, their income, the care recipient neuropsychiatric symptoms, their level of independence in performing activities of daily living, their cognitive functioning, and the care recipient quality of life, both self and proxy rated. So with this analysis that I conducted, I found that only care depression care subjective burden and the care recipient near psychiatric symptoms uh, indicated to be robust. So what this means is that I have enough, enough evidence to say that these three variables um, are correlated to the care quality of life. I also uh, wanted to know if there were any uh, factor that might be moderating this relationship between these three variables and the care quality of life. And I explored the role of the development status of the country where the study participants resided. Also the types of measure used to assess the care quality of life, which is basically which instruments were used to assess this. And the type of measure used to assess the, these three independent variables. So the main finding of this study 
was that uh, the moderating effect of the country development status where the study participants received was not significant for any of these three variables. So this is telling us that um, if we want to develop an intervention in the future, these three uh, variables are going to be important regardless of the opportunities offered for better health, education and living conditions across the different countries. Another uh, important finding from this first study was that all the included uh, studies in, in this analysis were using a generic quality of life measure or a health related quality of life measure to assess the care quality of life. So just uh, so you know, um, the World Health Organization uh, defines the quality of life as the individual's perception of their position uh, in life in relation to their goals, expectations, standards and concern according to the culture and value system in which they live. And the general quality of life have, have, uh, several, has several aspects. Uh, one of them is the physical uh, level of independence, psychological, the spiritual, religion and personal beliefs, the environment, the social relationships as well. Um, the health-related quality of life that I also mentioned is mainly related to the physical and the level of independence uh, aspects of the general quality of life and is directly and indirectly affected by health, disease, disor disorder and injury and for this reason sometimes can overlap with the concept of health status. So the problem of using uh, these kind of measures to assess the care quality of life is that according to previous study, uh, family cares of people with dementia tend to be older and there are several aspects that might be affected by age. For example, when you are older, you might have uh, a social network that is smaller than the one you used to have when you were younger. Or you might have some uh, physical problems that you didn't have in the past. So this is why um, for my study, I have used a measure of quality of life that is all age specific. So the measure, uh, the instrument that uh, I have used is called ISCAP O and as I mentioned measures all age specific quality of life and it has been validated in populations of informal carers for people with dementia. So as you may see it's more specific for uh, the sample that I, I wanted to assess. Also it measures quality of life in a broader sense and it's more related to um, the the capability of the individual rather, rather than uh, to, their, to the, their health status. Sorry. Um, also, it's a very important instrument because it measure, uh, it's useful for measure, um, it's a useful measure for economic evaluations in samples of older adults, um, older informal care. And this is a requirement when you try to uh, develop an intervention to use these kind of instruments. So I'm going to share with you some of the demographics of the first two studies. Um, but before that, I'm just going to mention how was the recruitment. Um, so I assessed participants from the Norfolk and Suffolk areas, and they were recruited by uh, clinical teams from NHS services, such as the um, NSFT Foundation Trust and GP practices. Also, by uh, currently approved related dementia studies run at UEA. For example, when someone took part in one other study, they can agree to be contact for uh, related studies. And that's how uh, we approach them. We also use the uh, Joint Dementia Research website that you can uh, fill in all your information and agree to be contact, for, uh, contact by researchers. Um, I also attended several um, care support groups in the whole Norfolk and Suffolk area and I was there just telling, about, telling them about my research and some people agreed to take part in the study. So um, with this particular study, uh, it, used to, it used to last between 90 to 120 minutes and uh, it had two different parts. The first one, it was a set of questionnaires that they needed to fill. <coughs> 
And after that, it was more like an interview, um, and most of the questions were about the family care. Other thing uh, that was important is it was that some people uh, used to come to UEA, or sometimes uh, I would go to their houses as well and conduct the assessment there. So if you are interested in more information about the study, or if you would like to uh, take part in the future, you can find the flyer at the reception desk that it looks something like that. <laughs> So I assessed 87 participants, and some of the demographics of the care was the average age in years was 69.5. Uh, I don't know if you can see it on top. I'm not very good with a <laughs> pointer. Uh, most of them, 67.7, uh, were female, which is very consistent with previous studies about family carers, where most of them are over the 60 years old and female. The, the most uh, prevalent type of relationship uh, was the wife with 39.1% uh, uh, of the cases, followed by the husband and the daughter. So we will say that most of them were a spouse. 72.4% uh, uh, of the participants live with a care recipient and 25.3% uh, percent of the participants uh, were member of a support group at the moment of the assessment. Regarding the training for carers uh, of people with dementia, 76% didn't receive any training at all, 10% uh, attended a course for carers, and less than 10% did some personal study, and 6% uh, did both, a course and personal study. Regarding the number of hours devoted to care, uh, most of them, 35.6% of the carers uh, spend 81 or more hours a week looking after their loved ones. Um, if we, like some people would probably say that, uh, that this was a 24-7 role for them. And if we take into account the first two categories, we will see that uh, half of the participants uh, spend at least 41 hours uh, looking after someone with dementia. So this is basically a full-time job for most of the participants. 48.3% uh, of the participants uh, receive help from a family member. And most of the participants uh, mentioned that the number of hours that they receive help it's uh, less than two hours a week, and some people will say that uh, this, this was not on a regular basis. Even though I assessed the uh, family carer, I gathered some information about the care recipient as well. And most of the cases, they were looking after someone with Alzheimer's in 42.5% of the cases. And that was followed by mixed uh, dementia, and most of the time it was a, a mix, mixture between uh, Alzheimer's and vascular. And after that, uh, with a 16.1% of the cases, uh, had vascular uh, dementia. The average year since diagnosis was 3.7 years. And most of the carers were looking after someone with 43, uh, sorry, most of the cases in 43.7 percent of the cases we're looking after someone with severe dementia. So it's very important to remark here that only five participants were looking after someone with mild dementia. So for this reason, we kind of generalize these results to those carers. 62.1% uh, of the carers uh, indicated to be using some kind of uh, medication for dementia, and in most of the cases, that medication was memantine. Uh, regarding the use of uh, drugs for neuropsychiatric symptoms, uh, those that use, uh, most of them, 33.3% of the cases, use antidepressants, and a less than 10% use uh, medication for anxiety and psychosis. And a very small, a very small um, percentage use some um, sleep medication. Uh, 
As I mentioned at the beginning, I'm a psychologist by background, so I was very interested in exploring how was the mental health of the carers. So uh, regarding depression, if we quickly see this, we can probably think that maybe uh, most of the participants didn't have any symptom of depression. However, if we add up all these values, we will see that 60% of the participants have symptoms of depression. Uh, something similar happens with anxiety, that nearly half of the participants have symptoms of, of anxiety as well. So again, this is very consistent with um, previous studies that said that there is a high prevalence of anxiety and depression, depression in this population. However, having uh, symptoms of depression and anxiety doesn't necessarily mean that they have clinical depression and clinical anxiety. So the percentage of people that had clinical depression was 28.7% uh, 20, uh, of the cases, and it, the same percentage of people had uh, clinical anxiety. The comorbidity percentage was 23%, which basically means that uh, this amount of people, 23%, had both clinical depression and clinical anxiety at the same time. 26.4% uh, uh, of the cases have a diagnosis of depression at some point in their lives, and 19.5% uh, uh, of the participants were using uh, some kind of mental health medication at the moment of the assessment. I also wanted to explore if there were any differences regarding gender. And I found that for both depression and anxiety, uh, female um, have more symptoms of birth than male. However, when I conducted a more specific uh, statistic analysis, that is a t-test, I found that uh, this difference in depression was not statistically significant, but in anxiety, uh, there was a no, sorry, a statistically significant uh, difference between female and male. So we can probably say that uh, females are at a higher risk of having um, anxiety uh, than male. And regarding, if uh, I also wanted to see whether there was any differences uh, regarding the dementia severity of the care recipient. And again, we can probably see that there are some differences among the groups, and probably the, the carers that are looking after with someone uh, with mild to moderate uh, dementia might have less symptoms of both anxiety and depression. But after conducting a, an ANOVA, I realized that uh, there was no statistically significant differences in depression and anxiety scores of carers uh, at different stages of dementia. So this is basically saying that uh, you can have these uh, symptoms of depression and anxiety at any stage of the dementia progression. So in the second study, I wanted to explore uh, if there were any risk factors that were affecting the family care quality of life. And for this study, I have included the three variables that I mentioned to you in the first study. But I also wanted to explore uh, the role of anxiety, the care, care anxiety, because as I mentioned to you before, um, I found that for in two, in two studies, that there was a very strong correlation between uh, care anxiety and care quality of life, but it hasn't been uh, widely explored yet. So I conducted something that is called a multiple regression analysis. And I found that, in fact, care anxiety was the only predictor of all age-specific quality of life. These findings, findings can suggest that if we target and uh, we improve care anxiety, that might be particularly important in promoting an all age-specific quality of life. This was a very important finding because uh, the current national guideline for dementia care in the UK emphasized that the carers of people with dementia are at an increased risk of having depression. But unfortunately, they don't say anything about the high risk of having anxiety as well. So um, this was very important 
because maybe in the future we can start thinking about the importance of this variable as well. Also, anxiety seems uh, somewhat neglected in the care literature. And, and this is very consistent with what I found before, that only two studies were reporting the correlation between uh, anxiety and care uh, quality of life. So in the third study, I was uh, trying to identify if there were any protective factors that affect the uh, family care quality of life. And if we go back to the slide that I showed you before, we'll see that most of the studies were looking at risk factors or at factors that kind of be modifiable by interventions, such as the care age or the care income. Um, some people might say that, well, you cannot change the care recipient near psychiatric symptoms, but you can train and teach the carer on how to manage these symptoms, and that can uh, <coughs> help you that as well. So, I was exploring different protective, uh, potential protective factors, and I found that psychological flexibility and self-compassion both predict well-being and are considered to be an important protective factors in many populations. However, they haven't been studied uh, much in family care of people uh, with dementia yet. But I found that they were um, very important in caregiver distress in family with psychosis, for example, or that they had an impact on mental health, sleep, quality of life, and life satisfaction among all their adults. Um, that it was a resilience, a resilience factor in individuals with chronic pain. Uh, that it had a mediating effect on the quality of life in patients with schizophrenia. Uh, also an impact on the quality of life, emotions, and self-management abilities in people with COPD, which is a pulmonary disease. Um, also, uh, it contributed to the positive mental health in university students, and also had an effect on the emotional response uh, among students with chronic academic stress. So I wanted to explore if these two um, variables were protective factors as well for this population. So for those who don't know what is this, um, psychological flexibility is the ability to fully connect with the present moment, being mindful of one's psychological reactions and to persist or change one's behavior in situations according to an individual's chosen values. The self-compassion uh, is related to the psychological flexibility, but entails being kind and understanding toward ourselves when we suffer, fail, or feel inadequate, uh, recognizing that suffering and personal inadequacy is part of the shared human experience. Also, it requires taking a balanced approach to one's negative emotions so that feelings are neither suppressed or nor exaggerated but observe with openness, and it's very related to mindfulness that you probably heard about that before. And these two variables can be improved by uh, psychotherapeutic interventions or, or psychotherapy, especially uh, acceptance and commitment therapy and uh, mindfulness-based therapies. Again, I conducted a multiple regression analysis with 87 participants. And I also uh, include in this model uh, the knowledge that the carers have about dementia because in most of the interventions for, uh, for carers, they tend to uh, target this. I also wanted to see whether the number of hours that they have of support from other family members had any impact. And I found that uh, both psychological flexibility and the numbers of hours of support from other family members were predicting the all age specific care quality of life. Uh, some people might say that, well, uh, it's not a modifiable factor because like the number of hours of support they, they receive from other family members because some people might not have uh, anyone else that can be involved. But for those who um, have someone else helping, if you remember the demographics, uh, most of the participants receive help a couple of hours a week. So even a few hours can make, uh, can improve the care quality of life. And if that's not possible, um, oops, 
work, uh, psychological flexibility is still is the strongest predictor. So um, if we target psychological flexibility, uh, we can probably improve the family care all age specific quality of life. And this can be uh, made through acceptance and commitment therapy, for example. So now I'm going to summarize some of the uh, main findings of these three studies. So, so you're not that <laughs> lost with all the numbers that I showed to you. So uh, if you want to think about risk factors, and if we want to improve the general quality of life or the health-related quality of life of the carer, it will probably be better to target uh, the carer depression, um, also the subjective burden, and the near psychiatric symptoms of the person with dementia. However, if we want to improve an all age specific quality of life, might be worth the um, target anxiety of the carer. Regarding protective factor, um, as I mentioned, there were uh, previous studies that were looking at this, but for improving all age specific quality of life, might be important to uh, focus on improving the psychologic, psychological flexibility of the carer and also, when possible, to have more support from other family members. Other important finding was that there are no significant differences in depression and anxiety scores of carers at different stages of dementia. So again, remember that you might have these symptoms at any stage of the dementia progression. So in the first three studies, I have used uh, quantitative methods. So for study four and study five, I wanted to use a qualitative methods to see if I could gather all this information that might be missing from these three studies. And I wanted to assess the acceptability of a future integrated support program for family carers. So this is still in the process of being designed, but I'm planning to run a focus group with health professionals, those that work with family carers and with people with dementia uh, regularly, such as GPs, psychiatrists, <coughs> psychologists, mental health nurses, among others, and a couple of uh, focus groups with family carers and former family carers. So the groups are going to be between are going to have between six to ten participants, and the duration is going to be between sixty to ninety minutes. And there will be open-ended questions that will explore some components that might be missing from these findings that I showed to you before. Also, if there are any educational needs and expectations that we're not considering so far, uh, if there are barriers and facilitator, facilitators to the implementation of this future, um, future support program, and the feasibility of delivery. So this means uh, if the family carers prefer to, do, uh, to have an online intervention or if they prefer, to be, uh, prefer it to be in person and also if healthcare professionals are willing to deliver this kind of intervention. So uh, before I finish, uh, in recent years there has been an increase in the number of interventions that have been developed for family carers of people with dementia but the problem with this is that most of them uh, have only been tested in the most economically developed countries. The problem with this is that if we see this graph that is showing the growth in numbers of people with dementia in both uh, in high income and low middle and middle income countries, we will see that at the moment and in the future, there are and there will be more people living in low and middle income countries. So having this into account in, after the completion of my PhD and in my postdoc, I am planning to uh, deliver and test an intervention that can be accessed globally and that can support uh, family carers worldwide. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you very much to my supervisors, Dr. Naoko Kishita and Professor Neida Miyoshi. Thanks to Juni West and the people from the NHS uh, Foundation Trust. Thanks to my funders, but special thanks to all the people that took part in this research because I wouldn't be able to be here sharing these exciting results with you if it weren't from them. So thank you.